Hello and Shalom Aleichem. I'll begin my story with a distant memory from afar. It was the early 1970s and I was around 12 or 13 years old. My friends and I were strolling along the back streets of Minsk in search of adventure when suddenly we found ourselves in an eerie place. It was a cemetery. We didn't know anything about it, were not even aware of its existence. The atmosphere was romantic and a little scary. The graves were all dug up with tombstones, a tumble, and skulls and bones strewn all about. Quite a strong impression. Suddenly I was struck not only by the overall spectacle, but by something more specific. I realized that I could not read the inscriptions on most of the tombstones. They were written in an incomprehensible language, although even then I could recognize those letters as Hebrew. I was also amazed that the cemetery was so large, yet seemingly belonged to no one. The final resting spot of the souls buried there, the newest graves dated back to the early 1940s, clearly had no one to look after them. This was my first encounter with what I now realize is the disappearance of memory, the disappearance of culture and tradition, evidence of the Holocaust in my own hometown. I would realize the scale of this loss only much later when I learned that approximately a century earlier, half the population of Minsk, the capital of Soviet Belarus then, was made up of Jews and that the main language of the streets was Yiddish. I also discovered that Yiddish in the 1920s and 30s was one of the four official languages of Belarus, something that made our country unique in the world. The fate of Yiddish literature in Belarus became clear to me. While the Soviet communists killed off all the writers, German Nazis exterminated all their readers. With this new knowledge, I was already just one step away from Meisha Kulbak. I first heard about Kulbak in the late 1980s. I was then working in a publishing house and often met with people in the literary world. To me and many of my colleagues, Kulbak was just another name in the directory of writers of Soviet Belarus. We could all very well imagine the kinds of writers active in the Soviet Belarus of the 1930s, so no one was particularly interested. But ultimately, Kulbak entered my life through another door altogether. In the early 90s, I was already living in independent Lithuania, completing my postgraduate studies at Vilnius University. And one day I learned that the university was offering seminars on Yiddish language and literature and immediately enrolled. These were led by the renowned linguist David Katz and among the teaching materials was Meisha Kulbach's poem Reisen. I simply could not believe that this beautiful work, which any nation would be justifiably proud of, remained virtually unknown in Belarus, the land to which it was dedicated. Subsequently, I discovered that Meisha Kulbak had in fact been the most famous and most translated writer living in Belarus between the wars, celebrated the world over, but almost unheard of in his native land. When Alexander Astravuk's wonderful Yiddish Belarusian dictionary was published, I knew I had to give it a test run on some really good source material. Having quickly discovered that all of Kulbach's works were available in digital form on the internet, I was gripped by the tantalizing idea of staging a full comeback for Meshe Kulbach. I am happy to tell you that translations of two early novels have already been published, The Messiah of the House of Ephraim and Monday, and the complete poetry of Kulbach is scheduled for publication later this year. Yet a proper Kulbach comeback will not be complete in the absence of a thorough biography. Alas, so far, apart from some encyclopedic articles, various prefaces and afterwards to translated editions, and a short 1993 book on his life and work by a former student named Daniel Katz, there is nothing in print. A significant challenge for any Kulbach biographer is the unfortunate fact that Except for his prose, poetry and drama, he left very few other texts. There are several reviews, literary essays, maybe a dozen letters, and that's it. No diaries, no memoirs, no social or political journalism.
So many biographical mysteries remain unsolved, not the least of which is even his date of birth. We do know that Kulbak was born in Smarvon, in the region between Minsk and Vilna, Belarus and Lithuania, Reisen and Lita, and that he left his birthplace very early in life. Suspecting they might be German sympathizers, in 1915, ahead of the German offensive, Russian authorities forcibly removed all Jews from the war area. Kulbak's family, his parents, brothers and a sister, moved to Minsk. Meanwhile, Smarhorn was caught in the epicenter of fighting and suffered significant damage. But by that time, Kulbak himself was far from home, living and teaching Hebrew at an orphanage in the city of Kovne. We know very little about Kulbak's early life, his childhood and education prior to Kovne. Still, some his work sheds light on this period. Of particular interest, however, is the fact that he ignores one of focal points of traditional Jewish life of that time, namely the shtetl. This institution was the main stage of all classic Yiddish literature. It was the center of the Jewish universe in the Pale of the Settlement, stereotypical almost and familiar to all readers. Yet it is completely missing in the works of Kulbak, a poet of only two exclusive and distinct worlds, the countryside and the city. We know that Kulbak's father, Schleime, was engaged in a profession close to nature. He was a timber middleman. His mother, Sime, came from a family of farmers in the Jewish colony Karka, soil, near Smarhon. Young Meshele probably spent a lot of time in his mother's village, seeping in the life of the peasants, their work and their customs. These were later reflected in the aforementioned poem Reisen. While still a child in Smarhorn, Kulbak attended a Heder Metukan, or Reformed Heder, and at the same time a Russian Jewish public school, and then left home at a young age to further his studies. We know that he studied in the yeshivas of Volozhin and Svinchane, but the details of those days are lost to us, as are the details of how and when he wound up in Kovne. In any case, Kovne was the first big city Kulbak encountered in his young life, and it is here that he began to write, first in Hebrew, later in Yiddish. About a dozen poems from that time are extant, but he never included them in any collections. And it was in Kovne that Meshe Kulbak wrote Sterndl, his first published poem, in the Vilna Literary Almanac of 1916, which soon became the basis for a folk song. Kulbak was still in German-occupied Kovna throughout the turbulent Russian events of 1917 and remained there at least until early 1918. When the Germans occupied Belarus in February of that year, Kulbak joined his family in Minsk. There Kulbak begins to teach, while also making contributions to Minsk's Bundist newspaper Der Wecker. These publications, however, remain a wide spot in his bibliography, as no one has yet explored the paper's archives. Among important texts of this period are his essay Dossi de Chevort, The Yiddish Word, and his first poetic masterpiece Die Stadt, The City, for which Minsk was undoubtedly the prototype. Kulbak remained in the Belarusian capital till the end of the German occupation. He witnessed the arrival of the Bolsheviks in December 1918 and lived under the new regime for several months. We don't know for sure how Kulbak responded to those events, but some hint is provided in his 1926 novel Monday, set in an unnamed city reeling from revolution. The novel's hero, a teacher of Hebrew, tries to keep his distance from all that is happening around him and seems to have little sympathy for the Bolsheviks. Instead, he actually harbors a rather irrational fear of them. A notation at the end of the city reads Minsk, April 7th, 1919. We do know that Kulbak left Minsk around this time, but the exact date and circumstances remain unclear. According to some Soviet-era texts, Bolshevik authorities dispatched him on a business trip to then still Soviet Vilna, and he remained there until the Polish invasion of April 19. But between April 7th, the date marked on the city, and May 30th, the first publication in Vilna Yiddish daily newspaper Tog, we lose trace of him altogether. There is no evidence of his presence in Bolshevik Vilna during that period. 
Since Minsk and Vilna were separated by the front line and there was no regular contact between the cities, Kulbak could not have mailed his poem to Tog from Minsk. That means that by May 30th, he was obviously already in Vilna and it's entirely possible that he wasn't sent there by the Bolsheviks, but actually fled from Soviet Minsk to Polish Vilna. Five days earlier, Tog published a short note under the heading Greetings from Minsk. The note states that some person managed to get from Minsk to Vilna by cart using side roads and provides information about the situation there. Was that person Kulbak? Maybe, maybe not. Yet somehow I can vividly imagine Kulbak crossing the front lines and evading smuggler tracks, visiting Smarhorn and the surrounding villages of his childhood as he made his surreptitious way from Minsk to Vilna. In Vilna, Mesha Kulbak continues to write poetry and literary criticism, sending contributions to Tog, where one of his contemporaries was the renowned literary critic Shmuel Niger. In 1920, Kulbak's first collection of poetry, Shirim, was published in Vilna. It included poems written in Kovne, Minsk and Vilna. The situation in Vilna at that time remained uneasy. The city was at the crossroads of geopolitical winds. By the summer of 1920, the Poles were replaced by the Bolsheviks. On September 1, 1920, the Bolsheviks handed Vilna over to authorities of a newly independent Lithuania. Having survived a whirlwind of five different governments in a period of two years, Kulbak flees to Berlin, taking nothing with him but his first book of wild poems. Berlin at this time was Europe's true capital. Many Eastern European intellectuals, writers and artists settled here after escaping the aftermath of war. At this juncture, Kulbak's difficult financial circumstances thwarted his plans to continue his studies. Instead, he took a job as a prompter with a famous Vilna troupe and augmented that income with fees paid to him for his submissions to literary publications. Vivid expressionist depictions of life in Berlin turn up in Kulbach's quasi-autobiographical poem Child Harold of Disna, which will be published in Soviet Minsk ten years later. Beginning in November 1920, Kulbach's works are published regularly in the esteemed New York Yiddish monthly Die Zukunft, edited at the time by former Minsk native Avram Lessin. It was in this publication that such famous works as the poems La Medvov and Reisen and the play Jacob Frank first appeared. With hyperinflation raging in Germany, the payments in US dollars that the magazine sent him were a welcome windfall. It was in Berlin that Kulbach also wrote his first book of prose, the mystery novel The Messiah of the House of Ephraim, which was published a year after he left the city. In spite of adverse circumstances, the time Kulbach spent in Berlin was for him a period of significant growth as a writer. He became a regular at the Romanisches Café, then the center of cultural life in the city. Here he mingled with writers, artists, actors and journalists, gravitating around poetess Elsa Lasker Schüler. During his stay in Berlin, two more of Kulbach's books were published in 1922, Lieder, an abbreviated version of the first Vilna collection, saw publication in Berlin, while Nye Lieder was published in Warsaw. Interestingly, Kulbach wrote not a single line about Berlin during his two-and-a-half-year sojourn in the German capital. Instead, the works he created here are suffused with nostalgia for the motherland, Reisen or Belarus. This yearning was evident not only in the choice of topic, as in the poetic cycles Reisen and Bagpipe, but also in the language he uses. The poems written in Berlin were increasingly permitted with dialectal features. Perhaps this is because it was in Berlin that Kulbach first encountered so many people speaking Yiddish dialects other than his native Litvish. This could not help but awaken in the poet a keen sense of his own linguistic identity. Not only did he begin to widely include Litvish grammatical and phonetic peculiarities, which deviated from the literary standard, he also started to use more and more Belarusian words and expressions in his works. In this way, Kulbak becomes an authentic voice of Belarusian-Lithuanian Jewry, and in his poems, 
gives vivid expression to their linguistic and cultural identity. In May of 1923, Meshe Kulbak returned to Vilna. Apocryphal stories suggest that the girl he loved before leaving for Berlin was about to marry and that his arrival was intended to thwart the impending wedding. Whatever the truth, Kulbak did indeed marry in September 1923, taking Zhenya or Zelda Etkina, a primary school teacher from Vilna, as his bride. The newlyweds settle down and Kulbak begins teaching literature to Vilna high schoolers while simultaneously coaching a local school theater group. As the years pass, his works are more and more widely read and Kulbak becomes a bona fide literary star. In 1927, Meisha and Zelda welcome a son, Elia, and that same year Kulbak becomes chairman of the World Yiddish Pen Club. He continues to write, and it is during the Vilni years that he pens the long poems Vilna and Bunya and Bere on the road. Boris Kletskin, a renowned publisher of the day, begins compiling Kulbak's four-volume collected works, which see publication in 1929. Though living and working conditions in Vilna were far from favorable. One of the main problems was his complicated relationship with the Polish state. Initially unable to formalize the process of obtaining Polish citizenship, Kulbak eventually rejected it altogether, holding on to his Nansen passport. This was a temporary visitor's document subject to stringent labor regulations. Accordingly, the Polish government limited the number of hours per day that Kulbak was allowed to teach, and he was forced to supplement the small salary he received from three teaching jobs by working as a tailor. In May of 1926, a military coup in Poland led to the establishment of authoritarian rule. Repressions against the democratic left ensued. Although Kulbak formally belonged to no political party, his leftist sensibilities were evident in much of his work. It was no surprise then that the new government closely monitored the famed poet's professional activities and his public speeches. Given this state of affairs, Mesha Kulbak decides to leave Poland for Soviet Minsk. It is entirely possible, however, that the decision was not solely his own. He may well have been forced to leave by Polish authorities, who sought to oust all subversive elements in their midst. To this very day, many assert that Kulbak was a Soviet sympathizer, swayed by propaganda about social paradises, equality and justice. That, however, is probably too simplistic a notion. First, let's look at the options a Jewish poet willing to leave Poland may have had in 1928. In his 1926 article Three Centers, Yiddish writer David Bergelson compares the conditions and prospects for Jewish writers and Jewish literature in general in the three main erstwhile centers of Jewish culture, Poland, the United States and the Soviet Union. The U.S. option had its advantages because in those days Jewish cultural and literary life there were in full swing. On the other hand, making a living as a writer would be next to impossible and one would have to resign oneself to work in a factory or office, practicing literature only as a hobby. Furthermore, Yiddish was the language of a tiny minority, likely to soon be submerged in the surrounding ocean of English. Even the children of writers would not be able to read their parents' books and Yiddish literature would likely fade within a generation or two. The USSR, on the other hand, with all its obvious caveats, was a land where Yiddish culture and literature could develop, even if hemmed in by certain ideological restrictions. It was, after all, home to countless Yiddish readers, most of them in Belarus and Ukraine. There, a writer willing to play by the ideological rules could easily make a living practicing his craft. Kulbak discussed his motivation for leaving Poland with friends and students. He argued that he was tired of teaching and wanted to devote himself solely to writing. Conditions in Poland simply didn't allow him to do so. He also lamented the lack of ideals of Jewish literary life in Poland, saying it was detrimental to him. Another motivating factor to leave was that Kulbak had extended family in Minsk his parents, brothers and a sister all lived there, and he missed them a lot. 
One thing I promise you, Kulbak told his soon-to-be former students, I will not lay myself on a bench to be lashed for my bourgeois sins. The reference is to a traditional punishment for children in Heder, but the point Kulbak was making was that he wasn't particularly sympathetic to the Soviet regime, nor was he some naive leftist deceived by propaganda. Finally, lest it be forgotten, in 1928 Minsk really did have the markings of a type of Jewish cultural metropolis. As I've already mentioned, Yiddish was one of the official languages. There were Yiddish schools, a pedagogical college, a Yiddish department at the university and the Academy of Sciences. There were Yiddish newspapers and literary magazines and radio programs, studies in Jewish history, ethnography, literature, language. Alas, roiling underwater currents were not visible from abroad. No one could have predicted that the great break was coming, and in a mere couple of months the rules of the game would be irrevocably changed. By the time he moved to Minsk in 1928, Meshe Kulbak had become Vilna's brightest literary star. Thousands came to bid him farewell at the Volkstheater on Ludvisarska Street. Mounted police were dispatched to maintain order. And the move to Minsk is also shrouded in mystery. Later, in 1934, on the eve of the first Congress of Soviet writers, the NKVD prepared secret dossiers on its participants. Hulbach's file contained the notation, in 1928 he illegally left Poland to come to the BSSR. What could have been illegal about an arrival that was known to everyone, and indeed publicized in advance? Newspapers of the day carried stories not only of Kulbak's arrival, but also that of Fadzei Braukovic, an advisor at the Soviet embassy in Poland. It's possible that Kulbak's passage was not only legal, but was facilitated by Braukovic and colleagues at the embassy. In any case, on October 19, 1928, Vilna's favorite son boarded a train bound for Minsk. He was traveling alone. Zhenya and their son would join him six months later. It was literally a cold reception. Minsk just experienced an unseasonable snowfall. Compared to the fanfare surrounding his departure, there was little attention from the press marking his arrival. The only acknowledgement of Kulbak's decision to return to Belarus was the publication of a modest collection of selected poems several months later in early 1929. Minsk's literary world greeted his arrival with caution. Menacing changes were occurring on the literary front. The Belarusian Association of Proletarian Writers was formed a month after Kulbak's arrival and would soon come to dominate literary life. This totalitarian literary sect had no place for Kulbak. It didn't take long for Kulbak to assess the situation. A few weeks after his arrival in Minsk, he wrote cryptically to his friends back in Vilna. I'm just returning from the bathhouse. One needs to clean and wash himself well here, lest he find himself on the sidelines of life. Kulbak sought refuge from social and political problems in creativity. Yet he wrote very little poetry after his arrival in Minsk in late 1928. We know of only four new short poems, which were later included in the collection Gekliebene Lieder, Selected Poems, 1934, and the satirical long poem Child Harold of Gisna, 1933, based on his life experience in Berlin in the early 20s. Instead, his creativity was harnessed in the writing of a novel. Excerpts from the Zelmenianers were first published in the literary monthly Stern. The first volume of the work appeared in 1931, and the second four years later. Apparently, it was expected from the author that the main idea of the book was to use the example of a large Minsk Jewish family to demonstrate the demise of the old traditional way of life and the birth of a new socialist one. But instead of this, the author describes the old way of life with warmth and sympathy and treats the new with mild irony which caused a wave of proletarian criticism. Zelmenianers is also a novel full of humor, something readers rarely encountered in the Soviet literature of the mid-30s. Meishe and Zhenya welcomed daughter Raya in 1934. 
That same year, Kulbak joined the newly formed Union of Soviet Writers and gained a seat on the editorial board of the aforementioned literary monthly Stern. Mainly engaged in editorial and translation work, it was during this period that Kulbak translated Gogol's The Inspector into Yiddish. In 1936, he penned his own play, Voitre, which was staged at various theaters. Throughout his nine years' stay in the Soviet Union, Misha Kulbak never became what might be considered a truly Soviet writer. In general, Kulbak's texts from the Minsk period reflect the observations of an outsider who never quite felt or even understood the surrounding reality. Ultimately, however, Misha Kulbak's work occupies a unique place in Belarus's literary canon of the interwar period. The writer, who was born in Belarus and came of age in Vilna and Berlin, whose work was published in renowned journals in Poland, the United States and Germany, who wrote in Yiddish and Hebrew and was fluent in Belarusian, Russian, Polish and German, was perceived in 1930s Minsk as a kind of extraterrestrial. It was clear that the authorities would not long tolerate such an alien in their midst. Arriving as he did in 1928 from bourgeois Poland, Kulbak couldn't have suspected his sojourn in the land of New Horizons wouldn't last for even a decade. The great terror that swept the Soviet Union in 1937 spared few, and Mesha Kulbak was not among them. He was arrested on September 11th, and on October 28th, a Minsk court pronounced him a Polish intelligence agent guilty of participating in a counter-revolutionary Trotskyite terrorist organization. On the night of October 29, 30, 1937, along with 120 representatives of Belarus's political, scientific and cultural elite, Mesha Kulbak was executed. The exact place of execution and burial of remains is unknown to this day. But the memory of Kulbak and others murdered that night is honored today at the Forest Memorial at Kurapati. Thousands of victims of Stalin-era repressions are believed to rest in that earth on the outskirts of Minsk. One literary critic wrote, In the confrontation between the Soviet regime and poetry, in which Kulbak found himself, one of the two had to fall victim, either Kulbak's poetry or Kulbak himself. Ultimately, it was Kulbak the poet that was the stronger, and therefore Kulbak the man was destined to die. Truer words have never been spoken. Kulbak the poet remains with us forever.